So, hi everybody, my name is Jonathan. Um, really nice that you came here. Today I'm going to present um, Python profilers, a profiler guide. Um, in this example, I'll showcase Python analysis as like data science pipelines, but just before we start, this is applicable for almost um, every application you could write in Python, being it web servers, games, whatever you like. Um, just during this talk, I'll have this as an example because that's what I'm most comfortable with. Um, if you have questions, you can find me outside here, of course, or online on Twitter. Uh, you can write me an email, and yeah, I work at Agnostics. We're doing um, image analysis for um, pathology microscopy images, um, helping pathologists with their diagnosis. So profiling, let's start with the basics. What is it, and why do we want to do it? It is we measure something. Actually, not we measure something, but the machine does it for us, nice. And what does it measure for us? Usually, we care about speed and memory bottlenecks. Um, why do we care about it? Yeah, because usually they are annoying. Our code is too slow, it takes too much memory, it runs out of memory. Um, so we want to identify and analyze those bottlenecks. That's actually what we have to do. The machine doesn't do that usually for us and mitigate them um, in the best case. Sometimes it's not possible, but at least understand more about it. Before we go more into profiling, there's one important distinction I want to have first, um, which is profiling versus benchmarking. Profiling, there we measure individual parts within the program. So for example, functions or code blocks or lines, and we care about the performance within a single program and identify parts within that program. Whereas with benchmarking, we usually measure whole programs or at least whole routines and compare them for different alternatives of implementations, other libraries, stuff like that. Um, I'm talking about profilers here, and sometimes you can misuse profiling also for benchmarking. And that's also sometimes perfectly fair. You just know that there's a distinction and you know that you're using a tool that is meant for profiling for benchmarking. Sometimes okay, but you should know what you're doing. One application for profiling is time profiling. Um, so your problem is usually you have slow code. Um, then you might have three questions. Where is my code slow? And how slow is it? The profiler directly should answer you this. The machine can do this for you. Why is it slow? That's typically your task as a developer. Let's wait until um, AI gets better with this. With memory profiling, it's quite similar. Um, that's the other typical application. Um, there, your problem is you have high memory usage or your memory usage maybe just could be lower and you could parallelize more. It might not even be that it's out of memory, but you feel like ah, it should be lower so I can run more of my parallel application, for example. Then we have the same questions, more or less. Where is it using the memory? How much is it using? And then again, why? That's typically again on us. One more distinction to make, and we'll dig into practical examples later. Um, it's about instrumenting versus sampling. So there are two different types of uh, profilers in general, and those are instrumenting profilers and sampling profilers. And in, in practice, that might make an important difference, and you should be aware which kind of profiler you're using. Um, the first is instrumenting, or sometimes also called deterministic profiling, where you instrument your code which means you have some part that is executed from the profiler for each function or for each line or for each code block you care about that you annotate somehow. And profiling always comes with some overhead. Um, and once you have deterministic instrumenting profiling, this overhead appears for every part where the profiling is happening. So if you do line-wise profiling, you should be aware that there's overhead for every line that you execute. This is sometimes fine because um, you don't care that it takes longer, you just want to know where it's spending the time within the program, and that's okay, but you just should be aware of it. 
But for example, if you have um, call stacks with um, a large def, maybe you have a recursive function, and every function call is instrumented, then the outer functions might appear slower than the inner functions because they all inner functions are instrumented again, and this overhead comes per function call. So if you have a large call depth, you might have slower performance in general, and this might also then have some influence on your results and skew with the results of those outer function calls. So that's something to be aware of. On the other hand, we have statistical sampling, which means um, we look at our program and dig into it just after some time points. So we have um, periodic sampling, where we have some frequency, where we um, ping our program and look, uh, where are you currently and which function, how much memory do you use, stuff like this. And depending on that, we get an outcome. And this, the overhead is then just naturally taken per sample that you take. So if you have um, a lower frequency, so you sample less often, then you have less overhead. If you want to sample more often, you have more overhead, so the overall thing is slower. But also your um, measurements are more precise in the end. So if you have a really low sample rate, you just ask your program every second maybe, you might miss lots of things that are going on under the hood, whereas if you sample um, in the milliseconds area, it's usually fine for, oh, I mean, totally depends on your application, but you can usually tune those parameters for the profilers you have at hand. And for timing profiling especially, um, sampling usually works fine because you care about slow and long functions, and slow and long functions are the ones that you will sample anyways because they appear more often. So in those cases, it's fine. If you look for short memory spikes um, that are really brief, you might miss those, for example, with uh, sampling profilers. So it totally depends on your use case. Again, um, you should be aware what kind of profiler you use and what's your use case. Let's have a look at an example, more concrete. Um, I brought this example where we have um, different colors here, different segments of an image, and it's a typical um, MapReduce problem. So in the map step that already happened, let's assume, um, we calculated statistics for each of those different segments that we show here in the top. And now we're in the reduce step and we want to combine all the statistics from the different chunks. Here in the top we have nine chunks um, and combine them to have the statistics per segment of the whole image. So I brought a small program um, I'll also share it with you later online, and you can have a look here. So this is just the main part of it. We have two different code parts in the beginning. We load the data from disk, and then we combine the statistics for the different chunks, and then we just have a print in the end to see that we've actually done something. Um, let's dig, not dig into details too much because the profiler will do it for us later. Let's execute this. Okay. Yeah, it's not that fast. So how fast is it actually? Mm, let's wait. Maybe 15 seconds. Maybe 18 seconds. Not sure. I mean, we can do that 100 more times and then the talk is over. Let's not do that. Um, so if you just have a small script and you want to know how fast it is, time works um, on Linux for you. And what we are doing now is benchmarking. It's a bad benchmark <laughs> because we're running the program only once and we just look how long it takes overall. But in the program, since we're iterating over more than one chunk, it's actually kind of fine and reproducible, at least on my personal machine. Again, everything you measure depends on your machine. So you might have different results than your colleague, your coworker. Um, yeah. So this takes 20 seconds, it's too long. Okay, what can we do? Yeah, we can add prints, uh, we can guess why it's slow. Um, I guess all of you did that, I did that myself. Sometimes it works fine. Just take the best guess, try it out, and then it's faster, good for you. If not, I can definitely recommend profiling. So the first profiler we look at is um, cProfile, which ships with Python itself. 
So in this case, we can just run our program, but we'll call it with C profile. So here we just start the module C profile, and dash S means we sort by total time in our function calls and run our script again. I'll directly use less just to see the results. Sorry, 20 seconds again. We didn't optimize yet. In the meantime, um, so let me explain what we will see. We'll have a table and we'll see the different uh, function calls and how much time they took. So one measure is the overall function time, um, so from beginning till the end, or just the time that is spent within a function, subtracting all inner function calls. Um, and total time is just the time spent in the function call. Cumulative time is the overall one. And here's also a percentage. So okay, we see there's time spent in decoder.py. I didn't write decoder.py. Um, maybe you also didn't. I'm not sure what this actually is. Um, so there's one more thing that we can do is just have a nicer visualization. Um, C profile directly doesn't give this for us, but we can use snake vis. So, okay, we have to run this once again. And this time we just write out um, the profile in a different file and visualize it afterwards with snake vis. And snake vis gives you um, a graph of your calls. In the top, you will see the outermost calls and below the smaller ones. Um, maybe you know flame graphs. This is basically um, similar to this, but here we actually have the call structure directly. So let's visualize this with SnakeVis. So this is a package uh, you can get from PyPI. And here we see some more about the code. So this is the outermost part. There's just a built-in exec. There's my analysis script. Okay, load data is taking quite a lot of time. Okay, some more calls, some more calls. Ah, here's decoder, where we actually spend the time. And now we see, okay, that comes from load data. So we actually see the call graph and can see which part is our application. Um, and here, you can see the, pr sorry, it's really small here on the side. Mm, that doesn't help, yeah. Um, you can see the um, part here on the left um, is the module path and the file path, so you can find out where it's actually coming from. And load s, for example, here is from Python 3.8, JSON, so that's just a built-in. Okay, we're loading JSON files. For statistics, statistics are numbers, JSON files are text. Maybe that's not super efficient. Let's optimize this. Okay, we have load data here. Um, let's see, load data is here. Yeah, JSON, ah, there's load data, HDF5. Nice. <laughs> yeah, I prepared that. Um, there's a whole different talk about those optimizations. Um, I'll have a link for you later if you want to dig more into this. Um, but instead of using text JSON files, we have binary files now and read those. And yeah, we can craft this. But let's use a different library, just because we can, and we won't care about profilers here, right? So, this time I'll show PySpy. Actually, for me personally, PySpy, I really like it for time profiling. It's my personal favorite. Not a strong recommendation, but just the thing I'm most used to. Also, SnakeVis snake gives you by, which is nice. I like it. <laughs> So PySpy, in contrast to uh, C profile, is a sampling-based profiler. So C profile instruments your code, and there are actually two different profilers in the Python standard library, profile and C profile. Profile um, is really hackable because it's written in Python. C profile um, is much more efficient, but um, yeah, but therefore it's not written in um, Python. So we have an error that is not really important. And here we can now open the flame graph that PySpy gave us. 
So in this case, the flame graph doesn't directly show you every function call and or every invocation because it cannot. It actually doesn't know um, which function invokes which other function because it doesn't instrument our code. It just samples from the code. It can see the call stack at every point and it knows, okay, this is above me in the call stack, but it doesn't know the order of the things, how they ha actually happen in the program. So what you see here, if something is right or left from another thing, that is not important at all because PySpy cannot figure this out. It's just the depth and you see this function calls this function calls this function. Okay, and now we see, uh-huh, we have load data here on the left. It's called here in different blocks. And here is combined stats. Okay, so it's 50-50 at least, maybe a bit better. Um, what else can we do in our program? If we have a look at combined stats, okay, we have dicts here, we have lists here, we do lots of calculations of, on lists and append. It's numbers, maybe use NumPy. Um, and there are different optimizations that I did already. Let's just run it on NumPy with a NumPy uh, version again. And, oh, sorry. And this time with a different profiler again. So here we use Scalene, also a very popular profiler, um, which not only does CPU profiling, but also memory profiling. And you already see here, um, we have dash dash CPU. Oh, it's faster. We didn't wait 20 seconds, you noticed. Um, and it directly opens the web page for us. And um, here we actually see the code itself annotated with the different times on the right, uh, on the left, sorry, how long it took. And it actually has some points here to activate proposed optimizations, enter an open API key in advanced options. Okay, they can actually send your code to open AI and ask them for optimizations. Um, I won't do that, but there's an option for that as well. Um, so yeah, it's faster overall and you can still see how much time is spent where. But let's say, okay, now with the time performance, we're happy with that. I actually spent half a day on the optimization in real life, so I was confident that's enough for now, at least for the talk. <laughs> um, so let's have a look at memory prof profiling, should we? So. Uh -huh. Memory profilers, Scalene again. This time, the default is that it profiles um, CPU and memory at once. I did it first only with CPU profiling just to only see the interface. And also, if you only use CPU profiling, it's faster. Profiling memory usually has a larger overhead than profiling your time. Um, and that's why also it's useful to split those two phases. If you want to profile memory and time, maybe actually profile them separately. And here we see our car. Okay, it uses memory in different parts in load data. Okay, we have to load data and it's not that much. And here we actually use 40 megabytes, 34. Okay, are those actually super precise numbers? No, they are not. And one thing we can do, for example, with NumPy is just lower your precision. If you t have too much memory and you think there's not super much overhead, I don't see a direct optimization at hand, maybe just think about do you need float 64 everywhere? In this case, maybe not. So we'll use unit 32 here. We just convert everything directly in place and have the NumPy array afterwards. So here before, we concatenated different numbers. And here we still concatenate the same numbers, but convert them to uint 32 before we actually have the array in place. So that should be more memory efficient. Let's verify this. And we're not waiting 20 seconds, nice. But still, it's more than the three seconds we had before with just the time profiling as you noticed. Okay. And this is now 23 instead of 40, I think we had before. Yeah. yeah. So this is much better. Also, you can see the memory average, uh, the peak consumption, 
And if you care about it, you can also see the copy instructions that are used. And Scalene also can give you um, GPU timings if you have, um, I don't know, TensorFlow, PyTorch, anything like that. Um, it also measures the time spent on the GPU separately. On the top here, you see the whole graph of your um, program timeline to have an overview of that. So we have one more profiler left, which is memory. Memory um, is, again, an instrumenting profiler. Scalene, what I just showed you, was uh, sampling-based. Memory, again, is um, instrumentations. File exists. OK, then let's just use this file. Yeah, I ran this before, so we can just reuse it. Um, and memory, again, has a flame graph here for you, but it also has tons of different visualizations. You can even write your own um, parts for the visualization. And has the memory consumption here, again, as a flame graph. This time, the width um, of one bar doesn't show you how long it took, but how much memory it consumed, actually. You can also see on the top here the whole memory consumption overall. But again, they have also different visualizations if you don't like flame graphs for memory so much, for example. So what did we see here? Do we have two, mo two more minutes? Perfect. Um, I showed you Python timing profilers. Uh, C profile it comes with Python. If you just want something really quickly, um, it's quite nice. Um, if you know all the functions you use and you ha don't have so many dependencies, then you will also recognize uh, the function names, and then that's perfectly fine. If you want to know the details where everything is coming from, the call stack history, uh, then you can visualize it with SnakeVis. For sampling-based profilers, so if you don't want so much overhead, um, then you can use PySpy. Um, it's also really nice that it gives you this um, homepage, uh, this website, and yeah, it can also attach to a running process, for example, which is really nice. So you start your program, and at some point you say, okay, PySpy now inspect this program. Um, that's super cool. Uh, Scalene also super nice, especially since it can do memory and speed. So you have just one interface that you're used to. Also, it very much depends on uh, what you like to see, if it's a flame graph or rather the code with the statistics next to it, just what you personally prefer. Then for memory, we had a look at memory, which is also super popular at the moment, and uh, Scalene again. And there are so many more. Um, I actually started a blog just to put the content of this talk here. Um, so this is codical.org. If you want to check it out, also if you don't like something, just uh, take it to me directly. Um, it's really fresh. And I have a list of different profilers there, if they can do time profiling, memory profiling, uh, nice visualizations, instrumenting, sampling. There's so many more questions I want to dig deeper. Um, yeah, if you want to talk about it, um, I'll also definitely expand on that on the blog in the future. So you can benchmark the overhead a profiler has. Um, you can measure its accuracy, like are the numbers correct and how correct are they? Um, you can see the different visualizations. Then one important thing, if you don't have just a small script, is does it support async, threading, multiprocessing? This is all documented for the different profilers, but if you think, oh, I have a more complex application, just check it beforehand, maybe. Um, can it support compiled extensions with um, Cython, for example? Um, and, of course, the OS. Then there's a whole thing about bottleneck mitigation. Uh, we don't have the time here to dig into it. Just showed it to you a little bit in the example. Um, I had a talk last year at PyCon Berlin about it, and you can find all the material, a video actually, um, on that link. And yeah, there's more to come. So from Python 3.12, there's a special mode to support the Linux perf profiler. Uh, I just read about it, it seems quite nice. And there's also the whole topic about continuous profiling, so if you have a long-running application, a web server, that might be something to look into. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Jonathan. Sorry, this is my coming in. Ah, but Oops. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Jonathan. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to try from here. One, two. Okay. 
Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Um, we have quite a bit of questions, so we, uh, they're I not, do too. <laughs> not uh, upvoted, so I'll just read them in the order of uh, sure. the incoming order. So first question is, what is the, where is the time mostly spent in machine learning workflows? Oh, it totally depends. I mean, models can take a lot of time in training, in prediction, um, but typically what you can often optimize is um, data ingestion. So data loading typically is the point where you can actually reduce time in machine learning applications, at least from my experience. But yeah, there's not one single answer to that question. OK, thank you. Um, the next question, oh, I should just have to kind of order it. Um, what's your strategy for profiling and improving very long running applications since the feedback loop is so long? Yeah, so one thing is if you can attach a profiler to a running process, that is quite nice. I did that with PySpy, for example. I had a um, web server, and then there was a special um, endpoint, and that actually triggered profiling the server and directly showed me the results after 30 seconds or something. So I could live inspect um, the server for just some time, and then during that time, I just pushed some knobs and ran the load that I wanted to run. Um, and also there's this whole topic of uh, continuous profiling. I don't have much experience myself there, but it seems super interesting. Um, this is what I've shown here. Pyroscope and Grafana Flare seem to be um, the platforms there, and they actually just merged. Um, the docs are not 100% clear yet what to use with which one, but definitely nice to check it out. Also, sorry, Pyroscope has um, Python support and also for different languages. So, yeah. Okay, next question. Which profile do you suggest? I guess profiler. Um, Scaling seems to be more well-rounded. Um, it totally depends on your preferences, I would say. Um, I mean, there are definitely better ones and not so good ones, uh, depending on your purpose. For example, if overhead of the profiler is an issue, um, for example, for live profiling, you don't want much overhead. If you want to profile your server continuously, then you definitely need low overhead. Um, then this just rules out some options. Um, one thing that I didn't show live is also Austin. Austin can also do memory and time profiling. Um, yeah, I mean, I just checked out those ones I showed you. I personally really like PySpy for timing, but that's just personal preference in the end. Uh, how to profile functions written in C++ and bound to Python objects? Um, yeah, so, I mean, under Python, there's nothing really specific about that. It's just another function. There are really nice talks what you can do with Dunder functions. It's just Python in the end. Uh, C extensions, there are profilers which can do it and others that not. Um, PySpy, I'm not sure to be honest, um, but... I'm pretty sure that memory can do it, and also Austin, um, yeah. But yeah, I'll have a bit on that actually on my blog, but also feel free to talk to me after that or hit me up online. Yeah. Okay, we have time for one more question. Uh, which of the profiler tools would you suggest to use to test scripts on a remote Ubuntu server? On remote servers? I mean, if it's just a running server, it's not that different at all. Um, you can typically, if you have a profiling file as a result, like this .prof I had from um, cprofile in the beginning, I opened it with snakevis, typically then you just produce this file on the server, download it and visualize it locally. Um, that is a good option. Memray specifically has options for um, remote profiling. And um, yeah, I mean, most of them either have some text or binary format output that you can download, or they just output a static HTML page, and again, that can be an artifact in ZRCI pipeline, or you download it from your server. Um, so it's quite exchangeable, those artifacts. Thank you very much, Jantan. Thank you.